So we are um, moving on. So one of the things we're going to have a look at now is uh, bas basic strength of um, alpha iron and gamma iron in terms of plastic deformation. So, so what's, what would be the stress you have to apply to get the, the crystal to deform or a grain to deform? Okay, so, um, and, and we'll come to this concept of what's called piles force. Did I? Uh, but let's first have a look at the theoretical shear uh, uh, stress. Um, and let's compute a, a very simple idea. We have a, a, an edge dislocation here, so like this, right? And then this edge dislocation moves up uh, to this, this position here. And um, so the, as it does this, yes, it goes through, you have to go through a potential uh, energy barrier. And this is shown here. Uh, yes. Okay. And um, so if, if we have an energy barrier and we take the derivative of this, yes, um, we get uh, the stress. We have an idea of the stress barrier. Okay. And that, that looks like this then. Okay. And, and um, good. And so you, we can see here that if this is the periodicity, yes, the, uh, uh, the distance between the, those two equilibrium positions, yes, uh, that is equal to B, then the, uh, the maximum of the, the shear stress in this case, because we have to shear the crystal to get dislocations to advance, um, is uh, given uh, by this and uh, uh, tau T. And uh, that occurs at a distance B over four. Hmm? This is B, this is half B, this is a quarter B, yes? All right, so um, what we do here, we continue here, is, is um, well, we will uh, get this, this stress variation here, yes? Uh, we'll assume it is a sine uh, function, yes? So, <coughs> This uh, sine function um, has a, a maximum here at pi over two radians. Yeah, so if I want to translate this into uh, you know, stress versus position, yes, uh, I uh, write uh, tau t times sine pi over two times x distance divided by the, the, this distance here. Uh, B uh, over four. Hmm? Okay, good. And and so what I'll do now is I'll assume that the uh, the, the the displacements we we have are are not very large. Yes, and that and that we can um, replace this sine function simply by this function. Pi over uh, so pi over two times x b over four, and, and, and that's so that's that's this function here, yes. And uh, we'll set this equal to uh, Hooke's law for shear. Hmm? So the, the, the st shear stress is the shear modulus times the shear, hmm? and the shear in this case is of course um, if this is a slip plane, and this is the next slip plane then the shear is, is this angle here. That's the shear, yes. And um, so that is equal to x, the distance, yeah, x divided by b, a uh, d, excuse me, d, the interplanar spacing, okay? So, um, so if I assume uh, these two things, that uh, Hooke's law applies, that, uh, that I can simplify this sine function uh, simply by the argument, I find this. This, this tells me what is the, uh, the, the shear strength of, uh, or it, it approximates the shear strength, the radical shear strength for alpha iron here. Hmm? Uh, so what is important here 
it's dependent on the ratio of B over D. Hmm? So it means that um, the, uh, this theoretical shear strength will uh, be proportional to the Burgers factor. The larger the Burgers factor is, the larger the this, uh, uh, shear strength. And the uh, larger the interplanar spacing is, the lower the theoretical shear strength is. Let's, let's just pl plug in some typical data points here, right? So uh, we know what uh, the shear uh, modulus is for alpha Aaron. Um, we use uh, 64 here. We know what the interplanar spacing is, is 0.2 nanometers. And we know what the Burgess vector is, is 0.248 nanometers. So we plug this in, yes. Uh, we find 8.3 gigapascal. It's um, 8.3 gigapascal is, is a large value. Um, we, um, we can make steels technically with uh, close to four uh, gigapascal. We can make, uh, you can actually buy wire with strengths of the order of you know, three to five gigapascal. Um, if you make uh, uh, so-called um, uh, very, very fine wires, uh, so-called whiskers of uh, iron, you can get uh, pretty close to uh, this values and, and uh, this value and, and, um, and, and even higher if the wire if the, if, the, if the whisker is small enough but it's an excessively high, high um, value um, still and um, this uh, theory uh, has been refined yes um, over the years we have some better uh, formulas to compute what, what we call the, uh, the pyral stress. Mm -hmm. So when you deform uh, ferritic steels, mm, the dislocations will move through grains. Mm, these grains are single crystals. Mm, and uh, the dislocations will encounter what, what we call uh, a potential energy landscape. Mm, it's basically because they run into periodic arrangement of atoms, yes? Uh, their, their potential energy will go up and down. If they remain straight and they go from one low um, uh, potential uh, energy channel to the next one. Hmm? So you, you, you've got this, this energy here. And the base energy, the minimum energy, is, is the, the, the line energy of uh, uh, the uh, uh, dislocation we had introduced before. And, and you know that's related as to the line tension. Hmm? Right, so, and, and, what, and then um, we, we call this, uh, we define a, a pyrus energy, this, 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 this shear stress or the resolved shear stress, which is required to move a dislocation from a, a potential valley to the next potential valley. Mm -hmm. And in the process, as it does this, it remains straight. It goes as a whole from one potential uh, uh, valley to the next one. And, and, and so the shear stress variation has, has this uh, uh, shape, as, as we discussed in, in the previous slide. Hmm? All right, so, um, so what, uh, you, you end up with, with a theory, yes, um, which, which gives you functions, which gives you the, the, the so-called Pyrrhal's shear stress, yeah, which actually looks a little bit similar to the, uh, the formulas, not much more complicated, I should say, to the formulas we've just uh, derived um, from a very simple model. The, the, the um, uh, Pyrrhal's uh, shear stress is G over 1 minus the Poisson modulus, and then exponential minus 2 pi over 1 minus Poisson ratio times D over B. And it basically expresses the same thing, is that the, the parameter that influences the parameters that influence the, uh, the pyrrhal stress are uh, the modulus, shear modulus, the Poisson coefficient, and then the, the ratio of the Burgers factor to the interplanar spacing mm -hmm. of the glide planes. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the same story. You have a smaller Burgers factor, the pyrrhal stress goes up. You have a larger interplanar spacing, the um, uh, 
Pyrrhal's uh, uh, stress goes down. So um, you can plot this. You, you can plot this um, uh, function, uh, uh, Pyrrhal's uh, shear stress divided by the shear modulus, yes? Um, and you plot uh, uh, the log of this uh, function as a function of d over b, yes? And, and, and what you find is that uh, it goes down as d increases or as the Burgess factor increases. And there is a difference between uh, screw dislocation, edge dislocation. In particular, um, we, uh, if we indicate the d over b ratio for alpha iron, which is about here at 0.8, yes? And the d over b ratio for gamma iron, which is a little bit less than 1.2, yes? We see that, um, first of all, the pyral stresses in the case of alpha iron are always higher than, than those of gamma iron, and the pyral stresses for screw dislocations are higher than for edge dislocations, okay? Um, right. Um, all right, this is it. Right. Good, the uh, ratio of D over B is temperature independent you know, because um, when, you, um, when the crystal e e expands due to uh, thermal expansion, uh, it, both the, uh, the, so the lattice parameter increases, alpha, uh, yes, and, and, and so uh, the, the D over, in the D over B ratio, uh, that gets canceled out. Hmm? All right, so, um, so, so if the, the, the temperature dependence of the pyrals of, of, of uh, the tau will come from the temperature dependence of G and the uh, Poisson ratio, okay? Right, so let's just, put, just so we get a feeling of the, the differences here, let's just put in numbers. Hmm? So we have these, the functions here, it's simple functions, simple exponential functions. So if we know uh, for alpha iron what the interplanar spacing is, what the Burgess vector length is, uh, we can easily calculate what the D over B ratio is. Hmm? Um, and if we take uh, reasonable values for the um, uh, modulus, shear modulus and Poisson's ratio, we can plug uh, uh, this data into the formulas, for instance, for alpha iron, we find 75 megapascal for edge dislocations and 473 megapascal for the, the screw dislocations. Yeah? And if we do the same thing for gamma, yes, we find that edge dislocation 3 megapascal and screw dislocation 52 megapascal. All right? Uh, just a, a note of caution here, yes? Uh, if you look at th these uh, values, you'd say, well, you know, these are really high uh, values, yes? Uh, uh, these only applies at 0k, yes? 0k. This, this, the equations up there apply at 0k. So the, the values we measure at room temperatures will be smaller. But you, very important here, um, it's harder to move screw dislocations, yes, than edge dislocations, yes? And dislocations will, in general, yes, be, have a higher pyral stress, shear stress, in alpha iron in ferritic steels than in austenitic steels, yeah? So it's harder to move a dislocation from one pyral's valley to another uh, pyral's valley in, um, in a ferritic BCC alpha iron structure. And that's important to know here. Now, of course, the equations uh, and, and the calculation of the pyrals energy uh, um, force, sh shear force that I uh, just uh, showed you uh, is at zero K. We're not really interested, there are not many applications, of, uh, zero K applications uh, we're interested in. I'm just uh, showing you here on this, uh, temperature scale in Kelvin and in uh, degree C, what typical uh, application temperatures are. There are applications which are very close to, uh, uh, to zero K, but they're not really zero K. That's, that's when we um, 
uh, we work with liquid, uh, 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 liquid uh, gases, huh? argon, helium, uh, hydrogen. Yes, we're very close. But um, th there are technical applications such as um, LNG huh? uh, gases, um, LPG gas, uh, liquid gases. Yes. Um, but uh, so in general, uh, line pipe situations will be used, for instance, in Arctic conditions. Um, but you know, most of the applications we're looking at will be room temperature. And of course, there will be machinery applications, uh, exhaust systems, uh, power generations where, where the temperatures can go as high as uh, uh, 900 degrees C in service. Huh? Okay. And, and, and perhaps higher. Um, so we were kind of in, we were not really interested in the very cold temperatures. So, okay, so, so um, in, in that case, it's, uh, you can actually um, e extend the theory uh, to, uh, to compute what uh, the Pyrrhal's energy would be at, at higher temperatures. We, we're not going to go into the theory, but because this formula is quite conveniently simple. Um, I'm giving it to you. So it basically tells you what, what is the pyrrhus energy of an edge dislocation at higher temperatures. You know? and, uh, and the only uh, thing you need to know is calculate the pyrrhus energy at zero Kelvin, yes, and then know basically what the melting temperature is of uh, iron. Hmm? All right, so if, if, we, if we do this for, again, and we do this for alpha iron, yes, um, we, uh, uh, we know what the melting temperature is, uh, 1535. Um, we know that we have 75 megapascal as pearl uh, stress for uh, alpha iron. 82 uh, megapascal for the, the shear modulus, and we also know the Poisson ratio of uh, 0.3. So if we plug this in this formula, the original um, um, 75 uh, megapascal, so this 75 megapascal um, uh, um, pyral shear stress that we get at uh, zero K is, is reduced to uh, 67. So it's a bit, a bit lower, okay? Okay, and, and, and we can calculate this uh, using, yeah. All right, so, um, so we know the, um, the um, theoretically, what it would take to shear the crystal so that it jumps f from uh, one valley to another valley, uh, low potential energy valley, okay? All right, theoretically. And um, for screw dislocations, it's around 400 uh, um, megapascal. So let's, let's f uh, think, uh, let's, uh, and this value here, okay, this 473 megapascal. And what we'll actually see is that uh, it's, it's not far from reality, hmm? okay? But um, let's now see at uh, what we can do uh, in experimentally to measure this, um, uh, the, the shear stress it takes to move dislocations in uh, alpha iron and in gamma iron. Yeah. Um, and then um, also see that uh, the dislocations uh, experimentally do not move from, do not jump in one jump from a Pyrrhus valley to the next Pyrrhus valley. There is an other mechanism that, that controls the motion of the dislocations from, from one equilibrium position to the next equilibrium position. Hmm? All right, so, uh, well, uh, most of us have heard uh, about Smith's law in 
uh, in our undergraduate studies. So uh, you take a single, yes, uh, uh, that's basically experimental, deter the way you did, it experimentally measures what, uh, what the level is of shear stress that you need to initiate uh, plastic deformation. And you can do this at any temperature you want. So for instance, uh, and, and you can do this for um, you know, alpha iron and gamma iron, yes? Uh, so the, here you have a single crystal. It's a single crystal of a steel. In this case, it's an austenitic steel, yes? And um, so it's uh, oriented hmm? and it's compressed. It's been compressed slightly. And you can see, the, you can see that there are slip lines. There's only one slip system activated, yes? in this particular case. Uh, so the, the shear stress at which the plastic deformation uh, uh, starts can be used as, um, um, we, we don't call it, uh, and, and we'll see why we don't call it the pyral stress, uh, because the mechanism by which the dislocation move is not the, the pyral jumping mechanism, uh, but we call it the critical resolved shear stress, and it's an important parameter uh, uh, that we certainly want to know for pure iron, yes, alpha iron, uh, when we do computations of strengths, yes. All right. So the, 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 the geometry is very simple of this test, yeah? and, um, and again, as uh, you probably know it, yeah? if you compress your crystal, this is an example here. Uh, the example I just showed you, it's, it's been magnified, yes. So what you have, you have your, your force that you apply, for instance, along a, a 1-0 direction, yes? Mm -hmm. On this cross-section here, the slip plane cross-section is, of course, different from the cross-section of your physical uh, crystal, right? So the, the cross-section, considering the, uh, on, on the glide plane, yes, is, the glide plane is this, right? So the, the actual, if you want to compute the shear stress on this, um, on, on the, the glide plane, you have to use A prime here, yes? Uh, which is the same as A divided by the cosine of phi, phi being the angle between the applied uh, external force and the normal to your uh, slip plane. And then uh, you also have to resolve the uh, uh, shear force, get the shear force, the component of the shear force along the glide direction, that's, and that's the Burgers vector. So, and and, and uh, that is given by uh, the uh, one over the cosine of this angle, uh, lambda, which is the angle uh, between the applied force and the direction of the slip. Hmm? Okay, and if you do this, uh, so the resolved shear stress is the force divided by the area resolved on the shear plane and in the shear direction. And you find basically it's the, the externally applied force over the uh, cross section of your sample times cos, cosine phi and cosine lambda. Hmm? Okay, and, and so. Um, and this, of course, is the externally applied force sigma. So um, if you measure sigma, yes, and you know the geometry of the test, yes, um, which, i.e., you know the angles uh, phi and lambda, you can basically uh, say that uh, sigma, the externally applied force at which you have yield, is m times the uh, critical resolved shear stress. Uh, times the uh, factor m, and m is so-called Schmidt factor, one over cosine phi, cosine lambda. Mm -hmm. And the maximum value of this um, is when uh, phi and lambda are 45 degrees, and, and the value of m is then two. Um, right, so uh, if, you, if you measure a certain uh, shear stress and, and the, the value of uh, sigma happens to be two, in that particular test, uh, the, the stress, the applied stress, will be twice the critical resolved shear stress. Okay. So let's let's just um, uh, look at uh, uh, 
example here, say, say you have uh, alpha iron crystal and it's oriented with four minus one eight um, axis parallel to the tensile directions. Uh, you'll, you'll wonder why, why do you use this? Uh, well, you know, because um, that's the best direction, uh, orientation direction, uh, to get single slip, yes? In this case, um, the slip system is given by uh, so the 111 uh, direction, that's the Burgess factor direction, and the slip lane is 1 bar 11. Hmm? And so we, we can directly calculate what lambda is by making the dot product between the tensile axis and the Burgess vector. Yes? And we can also calculate the angle, we can calculate uh, cosine phi by making the dot product between the, uh, uh, the direction of the externally applied force and the uh, normal to the slip plane. Hmm? So we find here uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.7 for lambda and, and cosine phi. And of course, that means that uh, lambda and phi are 45 degrees. And in other words, the Schmidt factor is one over cosine lambda times phi, that's two, and sigma is two times the, uh, the shear stress, okay? Right, right. So, and, and that's usually where um, undergraduate uh, information about critical resolved shear stress uh, applies. And, and, and we all usually assume that um, Schmidt's law is uh, univer applies universally. Well, there's, there are uh, uh, there are many more crystal systems where the Schmidt's law does not apply, and I said does not apply. Okay, and uh, most people think that actually Schmidt's law is a universal law. Yes, and uh, well, and, and one of the big uh, uh, exceptions to Schmidt's law are most of the BCC metals, yes? Most of these, including alpha iron, including ferrite. So uh, in steels, yeah, uh, Schmidt's law actually does not apply. Hmm? Um, so first of all, um, what, what does Schmidt's law say? Yeah? And, and, and here I'm going to assume that uh, you, you, you know, you're, you're familiar enough with um, crystals and, and, and stereographic projections that I don't have to explain it to you. Uh, but say uh, you know that when you take a single crystal, yes, um, you can represent the orientation of that single crystal uh, using stereographic projection. Yeah? And um, any specific uh, orientation can be any specific orientation can be represented in a what we call the a basic triangle in that stereographic projection. And, and this, this is the uh, 001 stereographic projection. So this uh, gray dot here is a, uh, a specific orientation, right? okay? Specific crystal orientation. Now, when you have a, an orientation in this crystal, yes, Smith's, uh, Smith's law says that you will have a single, a single slip direction and a single slip Plane. And the, the slip plane will be this particular uh, yeah, will be one one one, and the slip direction will be O bar one one. So it doesn't matter where we are, what the orientation is of my single crystal. These will always be the two um, the two defining parameters of the slip system: one slip uh, plane and one slip system. Right? In the case of Alpha iron, it's not like this. Huh? If, if I have um, crystals within with orientations 
given by uh, any of these points here. The only thing I know for sure is that the 111 direction, this 111 direction, will be the slip direction. When it comes to slip plane, well, it depends. Yeah? Uh, one of the things you, we find is that the slip is on the plane of maximum resolved shear stress. Yes? So normally, if, if the um, uh, uh, if Smith's law would apply, 0 bar 1, 1 would always be the slip plane. Yes? Uh, as it is, hmm, it will depend on, it, it will be, or it should be, the uh, maximum resolved shear, uh, shear plane. So that's a plane that's on this uh, trace, yes? And, um, and so if I make, if I connect this trace, uh, draw this trace, uh, that, that is the plane of maximum resolved shear stress. Right, and, and so this plane depends 100% on the choice of the tensile axis here. Yes? So I don't only have to take into account an angle lambda and phi, as in the case of gamma iron, lambda and phi, yes? but also an angle, an extra angle chi, yes? uh, away from what would be the slip plane if uh, Smith's law would apply. Hmm? Okay? Right, okay, so just a uh, note on the Greek alphabet and a tongue-in-cheek joke here. So lambda is lambda, phi is phi. This is the angle chi, so this, this angle is chi. And then there's another angle, this angle psi, capital psi. And for the Korean uh, music lovers, it's, it's it's psi, not psi, okay? Right. Um, okay, so, so, so in addition to lambda and phi, you have two, these two extra angles that play uh, a role, yes? Hmm. Um, and so, uh, uh, so, so you have uh, chi here, yes? So normally, yeah, if, if it was simple, the, uh, you would have the plane of maximum shear stress would be the glide plane, yes? And you'd only have this angle chi to worry about it. But in practice, it turns out that you get the actually observed glide system macroscopically is, is also not this Q, uh, this, the plane given by this Q, but uh, slightly away from it, the plane R, yes? And that is due to cross-slap, hmm? the frequent change of the glide plane in BCC R. So, and that's where um, there, there is a need to define this fourth angle, psi, hmm? and where, where we say, uh, where there's a convention to say, well, if uh, we measure psi from this plane, pole of this plane to bar two, one, one, then we, we say psi is positive and it's negative if not, okay? Uh, right, okay, so, Right, and um, yes, and, and so I think I've already said all this, yes, okay. So, and you would think at this point, uh, and, and the only thing you really have to remember is that it's um, the, 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 the selection of the actual slip plane in BCC is pretty much a headache, yes. Um, but that would not, that's not even enough. It's even more complex. Um, first of all, um, in um, alpha iron, there are very interesting temperature effects. Then there is also another effect. There are twinning, anti-twinning 
effects. Yes? And there is something that is the result of the non-planar core structure of screw dislocations in alpha iron, just to make things worse. Yes? Uh, first of all, it's the temperature effects. Well, it turns out that in alpha iron, I think I already introduced that, alpha iron, the slip system, the preferred slip system, the preferred slip planes will change with temperature. Hmm? And so normally at really low temperatures in pure alpha iron, you have slip on 110 planes. And as the temperature increases, uh, we get a change, uh, a gradual change at high of the situation. At higher temperature, we get 211 planes. Yes? yes? So normally you would think, well, in steels, our slip systems, because we work at room temperature, yes, um, should be 112 type planes. Yeah? Turns out that with steels, it's different, you know, the low temperature situation gets extended to high temperatures and we get one, one, zero uh, uh, glide planes are preferred. What is this twinning, anti-twinning symmetry? Well, the shear stress that's needed to shear a crystal in FCC in one direction is the same as the shear stress it takes to shear the crystal in the other direction. Not like that in uh, in BCC iron. Let me say, show you what I mean. Hmm? All right. Okay. So, um, so the pile stress, uh, or the, the, the I should call it the critical resource shear stress of dislocations, the in alpha iron depends on the direction, yeah? the direction uh, in which the dislocation moves. Yes. Yes. So that, that's also that's a violation of Smith's law, which doesn't say that, you know. Um, and, and, but, and it doesn't hold for gamma iron. Yeah? There, you could, it doesn't matter whether you go in this direction or in this direction, same value. Hmm? So, and in particular, you can see this when you look at 112 glide planes, yeah? Okay, uh, so what we're looking at here is a 110 view of alpha iron. Hmm? Okay, so this is the unit in that. Yes, so, so we're looking down a 110 uh, direction. Uh, the, those, the planes here, yes, the planes we see end on here are 112 planes, yes? Okay, so, so you can have glide on this, on these planes, and, and this is the Burgess vector, right? It's A upon 2, 1, 1, 1, okay? Okay, so this, you can have glide in this direction. Now, if you glide in this direction, yes, this atom will have to move over this atom, yes, to reach this position, yes? In the other uh, uh, case, this atom moves into this position, Yes, to uh, and, and then it will continue. Um, it moves into this position. Yes. Now these two uh, shears give rise to the same. Yes, the same shear. You can see here the same sheared crystal. The same sheared crystal you can see yeah, at the, at, on the glide plane, the same sheared uh, crystal. However, and, and you can see the shear is a, has resulted in a twin. Yeah? In one direction, yes, this, this, in this direction, yes, the shear was easy to achieve, yes. In this direction, it was harder to achieve because in this direction, the atom has to move over the hump created due to the presence of this atom, yes? So there is a difference in shear stress required to get this twinning, yes, in one direction, and anti-twinning, yes?
Then the other thing is the influence of this non-planar core structure of screw dislocations. Yeah? Well, it, it turns out that when you form a screw dislocations in uh, BCC iron, the core structure is not a very sharp line, but the core extends over other crystal planes, 110 or 112 crystal planes. It's not a stacking fault, yes? It's not uh, cross-slip, it's just the core is slightly extended yeah, into these directions. Yes? And as a consequence, forces force normal to the slip plane, yes? So non-shear forces, normal forces, have an influence on the uh, critical result shear stress. And then again, that's a violation of Smith's law, which says that you only have to consider shear forces. Yeah? Okay? So what do we mean when, uh, when we say uh, the core structure is, uh, is spread out over um, uh, slip planes which share the same slip direction? This is, this is basically what you have to consider. So it, if we look down if we look down the screw dislocation, the core structure is not localized here, but it's spread out over, yes, it spreads out, for instance, in this case, yeah, in these six directions, or in these three directions, yes? So in this case, um, it's uh, so, so in this case, because it spreads out in, uh, in the six direction, we say non-degenerate structures, and in this case, we say degenerate structure. So you can, if it's if it's uh, if it goes out on one one one, what, excuse me, one one zero oh planes, yes, it can it can go in have a degenerate structure either like this hmm, or like this. Hmm in the Y position or in the anti-Y position. Hmm? So it's important to uh, realize that this is not a stacking fault, right? And, but it's, it's more a spreading of the dislocation core. Hmm? Okay. This is a rather um, uh, really complex People have spent a lot of time um, trying to understand uh, what was going on because it's, it's not only a characteristic for alpha iron, BCC iron, but also in uh, other uh, uh, BCC metals in general. And uh, what is also, for instance, of importance is the, the handedness of the uh, the crystal structure, and you, you can show that uh, if you look down a 111 uh, direction, you will have channels where the, uh, the, the atoms form a, uh, a screw-like uh, succession of atoms hmm? uh, that, that, so for instance, in this case, the atoms go like, like this, right? They form a screw type uh, succession of atoms. This direction in the counterclockwise direction, here it's in the clockwise direction, yes? Um, and of course, everything happening at the atomic level, yes? Um, computing the uh, equilibrium structure of a, a uh, the core structure of a, a screw dislocation uh, requires calculations, right? In particular, um, so you do computational, uh, you use computational techniques to try to discover what the core structure is of these, uh, these screw dislocations, yeah? okay? Experimentally, hmm? go back to experiments, if you do very careful experiments uh, with single crystal, you can see these effects, yes? And in particular, so, so shown here, for instance, uh, you have, for instance, 
uh, this would be the orientation of a single crystal, alpha aron, yes. Uh, so this is this particular bar 1, 4, 8 orientation, yes. If you do this, and you, you, you squash this crystal or you pull it, uh, yes, uh, the, the, the slip system you, you observe is on the uh, O11 uh, slip plane and 1 bar 1, 1 uh, slip direction. So that means that this is the Burgess factor and you get this dislocation loops here on this particular slip plane. And if you measure the shear stress, yes, so you basically uh, pull this crystal, yeah, you go, uh, of course the crystal will be elastic for a little bit and then uh, you'll start plastic deformation. Uh, and, and, and you measure the critical result shear stress on 110, 19 megapascal. So pretty soft, yes, pretty soft. Yeah? Um, you can, of course, now change, yes, the, uh, the slip system. Yeah? Because, uh, you and you can change this by changing the angle uh, chi that we just defined, right? So, and if you do this, this allows you to, um, so if your, uh, your chi angle is, is zero, right? Let's go back here, just so you, you know what we're talking about. Because it may, so if this angle is zero, yes, my, slip uh, plane is this one here, right? And if we go back, right, and, and, right. and so that's a zero bar one, one slip plane, okay? A one, 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 oh type slip plane, all right? Okay, so one, one, oh slip plane. Yeah, so, so that's, that's this position here. Yeah? I can change within the, the, my basic angle. Uh, I, I can change this angle chi. Mm -hmm. And I can, make it very, I can make it up to 30 degrees positive or 30 degrees negative. Yeah? So that I get another slip plane. Yeah? If it's 30 degree positive, I'm in the anti-twinning orientation. So there, I'm do, I'm, my slip is not anymore on a 1-1-0 one, one plane, but on a 1-1-2 one, one, type plane. And in the other direction, it's on a similar plane, but with a shear in the other direction. And you, and you can see that the shear, yes, to start the, uh, uh, the slip, the deformation, will be uh, higher to start with. And, and second, um, will not be the same. It will not be symmetric. Hmm? So this is definitely a proof that the um, uh, Schmidt's law does not hold for uh, alpha iron. Th these differences are small. Okay, that's important. That I want you to notice this. So 23 and 26. So that's only three megapascals of difference. So you really need to be very careful experiments here, yes? Uh, and this is a actual raw data, yes? This is the actual, this is the, this, the externally up measured flow uh, or, or um, uh, yield strength on your, on your crystals. Huh? And then, so um, you remember that uh, we calculated that it's for, for this specific case the angles were 40, the two angles were 45 degrees. So the difference between, uh, uh, we, cal we simply calculate the resolved shear stress from the measured applied uh, shear stress, right? So what we actually measured here was not 19 megapascal of, uh, of shear stress, but we measured 38 megapascal of yield stress, right? That's what we measured. And then we divided this by two yeah, to get the critical result shear stress of 19, all right? Okay. Uh, 
so this is the other uh, uh, thing that's important for for iron is, is is the fact that you know depending on the temperature you'll have uh, different slip uh, planes. So if you if you plot the, the temperature and you plot what we call the active stress, um, th that means you only plot the temperature dependent part of the uh, of the stress hmm? of the shear stress. Hmm? That, that's why it looks here like the, like the stress is 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 zero at room temperature. It's not zero, you we just removed anything that was temperature independent, okay? Um, and, and so and you see alpha iron, uh, there are, you, you can see that as the, the, the temperature decreases, the increase of the uh, critical resolve shear stress with temperature uh, goes over different uh, uh, curves here, yes, and different, and there are different zones of um, of um, uh, glide, uh, different temperatures, uh, ranges where the, the the glide plane is different, and, and in particular, in pure alpha iron, you get one one o glide at at very low temperature, as and as you go higher. This one, one, two, pure alpha iron. Once you alloy this, you go into alloying, it's different. The whole picture changes, yeah, which makes things you know, even more difficult with steels because a lot of the fundamental data on alpha iron you can't really use for steels because it's, it's different yeah, because of the alloying. And that's what I, I show here is that for alloys softened, and it'll look very uh, odd, but, uh, and we'll come back to that. Um, when, when we alloy, actually, at the lower temperature, we find that the alloying causes a softening of the alpha iron. Yes? But what's important uh, for us now is that when we, when, when we alloy, our 110 uh, slip system is, is favored rather than 112. One of the things I, I would like to mention, you remember when we calculated the Pyrrell's uh, shear stress? Yes? We found a value of uh, 473 megapascal at 0K. If you, go, if you look here, yeah, experimentally measured values at 0K for the critical result shear stress, not very far away. It's, it's around 400 megapascal at 0K. This graph also, by the way, reveals a very strong temperature dependence of the, uh, of the effective stress or, or the uh, result shear stress, yes? And, and we'll see that this is also uh, non, uh, an important uh, characteristic of uh, iron. Uh, one of the things that's really important, and, and uh, it's always been uh, a challenging aspect of getting good data for, uh, for iron, is the fact that even extremely small amounts of alloying have an impact on what you measure, yes? And, and uh, for instance, in this case, uh, we have uh, iron the effect of carbon on the uh, critical resolved shear stress. And you can see that uh, you know, if, if you add uh, 20 ppm of carbon, and it's very, very small amount, you can already see almost uh, you know, doubling of the uh, critical resolved shear stress. So you have to be really careful. And there are not many extremely high purity iron single crystals which, which allow you to, to to measure, to do fundamental experiments, okay? Uh, right, so, so what does it mean for us? Well, you know, because at the end of the day, most of us are here to, uh, not here to work on pure alpha iron single crystals. Uh, what, what's the influence? Well, first of all, we, 
let's, let's talk about this twinning, anti-twinning effect. Is that important? Well, we've seen in, you know, when you do the measurements, it's a difference between 23 megapascals and 26 megapascals. That's not really uh, a very important difference from a technical point of view. Hmm? And uh, a lot of these violations of Smith law, we don't really have to um, you know, worry too much uh, about them and their impact. Hmm? However, one of the things we should remember is that a lot of these violations are a result of the complex core structure of screw dislocations. Yes? And as a consequence, a pronounced temperature dependence of the mechanical properties of alpha iron and all the ferritic steels. Okay? And that's something we, you know, is really important to remember. Hmm? Hmm? So what is important is that we have in practice the low mobility of screw dislocation, alpha iron, and in steels, yes? That's a direct consequence of the, this degenerist core of, uh, of the screw dislocation. And the screw dislocations are not lines, they're, they have, they're extended, yes? So that makes it difficult for them to move, yes? How they are extended is still a matter of discussion, yes? Uh, even today, you know, uh, people in um, um, solid state physics and metal physics are interested in this topic, okay? It's not an old topic where uh, all the, the physics has been done yet, okay? Um, so th the way the you, the, you have the degeneration of the core structure is, is still a matter of, of discussion. You know, it's, is, is it on one one two planes? Is it, uh, is it degenerate? Is it non-degenerate? Is it on one one O planes? Um, the importance, for, what's important for us is it is degenerate and this has impact on the mobility of the screw dislocation. It's very, it's very low and at low temperatures. So what's, you know, what does that mean, low mobility? Huh? Well, your, your core structure, yes, looks like this. Yes, the core is not a line on the glide plane. Yes, it's extended. It's it's ex in other words, it's extended out of the uh, glide plane. Yes, so if this is the glide plane, for instance, the the core is extended like this. There's only one, only this little part is in the glide plane. Yes, so if if this dislocation needs to move on this glide plane, yes, it will, you will first have to change the core structure, yes? Change the core structure so it can glide, yes? And as soon as it stops, it will extend again. Hmm? Hmm? So, uh, if, uh, say if you, your, your core structure looks like this, and this is your glide plane, the first thing that has to happen is these bits here have to be removed, yes? yes. And then the dislocation can move, and as soon as it stops, yes, it extends again, right? And uh, of course, because it's extended, yes, um, you also get different ways that dislocations can move. Yes, it can move out of its glide plane. Yes, um, this is shown, for instance, and and this is where the the uh, non-shear stresses, the stresses normal to the glide plane, start playing a role. Hmm? So, for instance, in this case, um, the the stress normal to the glide plane causes the dislocation these bits to uh, move to the core and the dislocation moves this way and then this way and this way. Yeah. So, um, and, and you can see that this way the dislocation can move for a little bit along the 110 direction, but if it um, chooses to, to go um, 
in a succession of these two first steps, it can go like this. Yes? And then um, it, it looks like it's moving on a 112 direction, on a 112 plane. Yes? Okay. But the thing is, the dislocation just doesn't jump from one Pyrus Valley to the next Pyrus Valley. Yeah? It first has to be constricted, and then it can move. And as soon as it stops, it expands again. Yes? So, uh, and, and that is the reason, the fundamental reason why dislocation, uh, screw dislocation mobility is so low. Because it doesn't happen on the edge dislocations. So, maybe I can finish with this. So, um, so what you get is the, the pyral stress yeah, is very high uh, uh, for screw dislocations in comparison to edge dislocations. Mm -hmm. Namely, it's about 20 times higher. Mm -hmm. And that is a direct result of the non-planar structure of the core of screw dislocations. And this it gives them very low mobility. And when you have dislocation, say I have a dislocation loop like this, yes, and it expands because I apply an external force, yes, what am I going to see if, so this is the screw part, and this is the screw part, and this is the edge parts, yes, what am I going to see in practice? Well, the edge dislocations move very quickly. They don't, they're not extended. The screw dislocations move very slowly. Well, these guys don't move, and these guys move very fast. So let's make them move this way. These guys don't move. So my dislocations start to look like this. Yes? The pieces that move very fast, there are not many of them, yes? The pieces that move very slowly, you get to see a lot of them. So when you, when you make a TM sample of ferritic steels or alpha iron that's been de uh, deformed in single slip, that's what you see, long, uh, long dislocation lines that are in with B parallel to the line directions. So they're all screw dislocations, yes? So this is a direct proof of the fact that um, we have the, uh, this non-planar uh, 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 core structure of screw dislocations in, in alpha iron. Okay, we'll continue with this uh, subject next Monday. Thank you for your attention.